Good afternoon, dental internet world. My name is Dr. Vishal Sharma, and I'm here alongside my friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Parchewski. Mike, I don't know about you. I've had a long work week. I'm actually feeling a bit tired. Admittedly, I've got some coffee in my water cup today. Uh, how are you doing? And, and tell our listeners what we're planning on discussing today. Well, that's, uh, I agree with you on that, uh, the coffee mode, but I, I've, I've got Red Bull snuck into mine here. Um, now, today what we're going to talk about is sleep apnea. So it's a fitting, fitting topic here but that we're both sleepy. Um, but really what are critical for the success of sleep apnea in our practice is getting our teams involved. And so I really feel it's important for us to talk about the team's role and how they can help in getting the sleep apnea going in the clinic. I do think it's important that we address, you know, for, for people that are logging in or tuning in for the first time here, what is uh, obstructive sleep apnea? Can you go through that for the listeners? Yeah, so obstructive sleep apnea is a medical condition that involves a partial or a complete obstruction of the upper airway. And Mike, that results in the prevention of regular breathing and therefore it reduces our oxygen intake. It can be treated by a dentist or a medical doctor, but currently we do require an MD for a definitive diagnosis. You know, and just to kind of get into some other um, aspects, it's estimated that about one in five people in North America is affected by sleep apnea, and uh, about 25% of males would, would be affected with uh, 15% of premenopausal women. So the most staggering statistic of all is that about 80 to 90% of apneas are currently undiagnosed. So it's clearly an underdiagnosed problem. Um, it is getting some growing awareness within the media on our website we do have some links to a canadian cbc uh, documentary that discussed sleep apnea so it's becoming certainly more mainstream uh, much as with your practice a lot more of our patients are asking about it because they're more familiar with it and certainly more f uh, physicians are recognizing uh, the benefits of identifying sleep apnea and then treating it through what we can do which is oral appliance therapy um, and that's been a big paradigm shift in medical schools, whereas in decades past, the condition and disease wasn't nearly as well understood, and therefore there wasn't as much time dedicated to it in medical curriculums, and certainly that would uh, follow with dental curriculums as well. So the other aspect, of course, and, and certainly this is a bit more prevalent south of the border, but it's a concern in Canada as well, uh, increasing problems as the average BMI has been uh, increasing or going up as the years and decades has, has been going by. So. That's kind of an overview of what obstructive sleep apnea is, why it's important. Um, but Mike, I do have a question for you more on the business aspect of things. Like why, why would a dentist or a dental office want to get involved in this? Why does this screening really matter? Yeah, so I think screening and identifying patients with sleep apnea is super important. Now, just to add on to what you discussed, the thing about sleep apnea and sleep itself is we're hearing it in the news all the time now how important sleep is, how little, you know, disruption in sleep patterns can cause all kinds of issues from increased hunger, you know, poor production, um, you know, not being able to function well, driving issues, falling asleep during the day. But the other big aspect of that is the comorbid diseases. So there's a lot of diseases that have been related to sleep apnea, and I think those numbers and the different diseases that are related to it are just increasing. Now, it's not just only sleep apnea but any sleep condition or any condition where you're you know you're not getting enough sleep um, using your tablets at night things like that anything that's preventing you getting quality sleep is I think is having a huge impact on our health and I, so I think that's really important is that we're seeing more awareness of sleep and sleep disorders and that really brings the sleep physicians more back into vogue in the in the medical community about how important that important that is and as dentists we're recognizing it more so we can work well with our medical communities together to make it you know, a more aware uh, the awareness increasing so that it's not um, only you know 10 or 15 percent of people that are that are have it are actually being treated now in your own clinic if you think about it uh, let's say you have a clinic of 2,000 patients um, a couple key factors to remember is that um, in the population where you were talking about 20 to 25 percent mm -hmm. of, of population so let's say you have 600 of your patients have sleep apnea now m patients can be treated with a CPAP 
and a CPAP is, is sort of been the standard used in the metal com community. CPAP has a 100% success rate because it's basically blowing their airway up like a balloon. So it keeps the airway open, air is able to move, and, um, and patients are, are, are able to breathe and sleep better. The issue with the CPAP is the compliance and the, and the use of the CPAP is not great. So the success level of CPAP is not fabulous. Now with the oral appliances that we, we use, 70% um, of the patients will respond. So not 100% like CPAP, but we're talking 70%. So 70% of the patients that have sleep apnea can be treated with an oral appliance and the compliance rate is better. So if you think about those 600 patients and 70% of them would respond, so now you've got about 400 patients in your patient base. And if, you, if you're gonna treat these patients with an oral appliance, and let's say the lifespan of an oral appliance two to three years, um, you know, that's, and that's gonna give you um, and even if you were, let's say, only treating a third of those patients, because some of them say, I don't know, I don't really want to get tested right now, I'll get tested later. But realistically, you're going to end up with 100, 150 patients a year. That alone, you know, if you're only seeing a third of them. So mm -hmm. that gives you three years of seeing patients in your clinic if you're treating 10 of them a month. Well, by the time that's done, the people that you saw in the first year are ready for a new appliance. So. I think that there's a, you know, and then that's not including referrals, that's not including new patients coming in. So that's where the economic benefits are, is that you already actually have a sleep practice within your practice. It's just a matter of getting them screened and starting to realize um, that some of those things that were going on with your patient's inflammation, gum disease, uh, clenching, grinding, may have been sleep apnea all along. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a strong economic component to it, and you've laid out the numbers very effectively. You know, for my uh, practice and my integration of uh, dental sleep medicine and oral appliance therapy, I've also found that, in, especially in, in male patients, Mike, it's the most profound and impactful service that we've ever offered. It's quality of life changing, and a lot of the things that you identified in terms of cortisol levels, memory, mood, wakefulness, et cetera, all those things that can have a significant positive impact on. So you had briefly alluded to things like gingival irritation, bleeding gums, worn dentition. This sounds like something where you have to kind of involve the entire team in that, which not surprisingly is the topic of our discussion today. Can you walk through how you do that in your office? So the full team involvement is really critical. Um, like anything, when we when when us dentists go and take these weekend courses, or we we learn about something, or we bring back a new technology, or listen to a fantastic podcast and get great tidbits of information. Yeah, that's probably the number one thing I think out there. Um, but the important thing is, is when you've done that, is you've you're bringing that information back, and your your team is just like has no idea what you're talking about. They're they're not really following where you're coming from. And then your integration of the of the new technology, or in this case, sleep, just kind of falls by. And then it's like, okay, we're back into the regular routine. You're not really noticing it as much. So you really have to get your team trained. Um, and it just happens that we also do team training sessions. Um, if you go to our website, we can help you get some information on that. But the, the important is that everybody's on the same page. Everybody is understanding what we're looking for. And the, some of the key things that we're looking for is the patients with the high BMIs, people that uh, are snoring or partners report them snoring, uh, high blood pressure. You know, we have our hygienist taking the blood pressure. Um, gender, again, this is what you mentioned as, as a big treatment for the male patients, uh, the postmenopausal women. So it's that age over 50. And again, bruxism, there's a lot of uh, research now showing that um, there's a correlation of about 40 to 60% between the clenching grinding that goes on with our patients and sleep apnea. So we kind of want to be aware of the sleep side to know if it's actually um, a, just a grinding or if it's actually sleep apnea. Now, in your new patient forms, um, what sort of questions have you added um, to start adding, to, like to start to screen for it? Well, of course, the easiest approach is to incorporate some of these questions into your new patient form. Uh, the most obvious one, of course, is have you ever been tested for sleep apnea? And obviously, have you ever tried a CPAP? Anyone who has been on a CPAP machine, they've, of course, had a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. As you mentioned, they may not be very compliant as compliance rates for the CPAP are relatively low. Uh, so that would be a good indication that that might be someone uh, that you want to discuss the, these things further and further investigation would be required. 
uh, asking their bed partner uh, if they snore or have they ever been told that they snore. You know, you alluded to wakefulness or alertness. Have you, do you have difficulty waking up in the AM? Are you using an alarm clock? Uh, late in the afternoon, are you and your lecturing partner uh, drinking caffeinated and Red Bull beverages to stay awake? Uh, do you ever nap during the day? And then, of course, uh, going to the bathroom at night can be related to, so prostate enlargement, of course, but it can also be related to uh, OSA. And then you alluded to grinding or clenching of the teeth. And that is sort of the main aspect that we're typically looking for. It's really easy for the hygienist to identify, and it's it's an easy transition for uh, a dental office is just to uh, to ask that question or have that on the intake intake form, and so that's what we have on our forms, Mike. Obviously, there's a great opportunity to have conversations in the chair. What sort of things are you and your team asking patients while they're in the chair? So I think I think what you've alluded to there has covered that really well. Um, so we'll ask some of those types of questions in the chair as well. But often, you know, with the hygiene appointment, they're just asking a few things. Um, any changes in your medical history, um, you know, any, and then they'll, they'll know the patient's medical history. So if they have a history of high blood pressure, they would ask those kinds of questions um, about, you know, have they been tested previously. But oftentimes, just as in, in regular visits, we're asking, you know, uh, how's your sleep been? And that just sometimes that simple question is opening the door mm-hmm. to the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm cautious with my, my team because we do know that the question about, um, daytime sleepiness is one of the more poorly correlated. Um, we are, are humans that are, are driven to survive and um, driven to, to get through adversity. And so often we are pummeling ourselves into unhealthy situations, but we're so fiercely staunch going to not let that affect our daily routine. So it's often that um, people can have that, uh, not know that they have sleep apnea. Um, so I find that that sometimes is not the greatest question to wean that out. So we try to ask things more about, you know, does your partner ever notice you snore? Because often they'll go, yeah, they complain all the time about it. Um, do you ever wake up with headaches or a dry mouth, a sore throat? Um, or do you ever find that you're, you're wake up with your heart racing or, or are gasping for air? So we try to ask those kinds of questions just prompting them because it usually it's something to do with snoring or waking up frequently in the night with a, like a racing heart or gasping for air yeah. that is is the more more critical one and of course the clenching grinding is huge yeah you know so when we have uh, obviously patients in the chair one of the things that i discussed is is having the hygienist bring things up and, and that's a seamless transition you're in for a hygiene appointment what are the dental signs that your hygienist can identify that may suggest there is some underlying sleep-related issues. And those are pretty simplistic. Clenching and grinding, as you just mentioned, so recession where, you know, bony exostosis, which is a reaction to chronic heavy forces on the cortical bone of the uh, mandible or the maxilla. Uh, Redness around the pharyngeal tissues or or the uvula. You alluded to dry mouth or sore throat. That air pressure that's going over an area that gets constricted, that of course will irritate some of those more sensitive uh, pharyngeal tissues. Enlarged tonsils or higher grade malampati, uh, in the last presentation we gave, you had a really great chart and poster illustrating the malampati closing down from the top and of course the tonsils uh, closing from the lateral aspect. Scallop tongue, which of course can be related to forward tongue posture, the indentations occurring. Uh, from the position of the molars and the teeth. And then, of course, a class two skeletal relationship can uh, also uh, indicate that there might be some sleep issues. So, you know, between what the questions you're asking in in the chair, uh, what we discussed on the forms, and then, of course, the oral signs, uh, you know, you really can get a good idea as to whether someone requires further investigation. So just back to the forms, Mike, can you touch base on the forms that you're typically using and what they all entail? Yeah, so I think it's also important, a um, couple things is that we are doing, because uh, there's some great peer-reviewed uh, qualitative forms that are great questionnaires for our patients. So if a patient's coming for the concern of sleep, we really want to, to use these questionnaires because they will give us an idea of the severity of the problem for the patient. And so the stop-bang form is one that we use 
um, which talks about, you know, is a lot about um, the blood pressure, um, you know, uh, breathing issues, tired feeling. Um, we also use the Epworth Sleepy Scale, which is about when you feel more sleep, when you feel more uh, likely to fall asleep. Those are, those are important things. Um, and then we have a clinical exam form that we use. And again, that's something we, can, we, we outline in the webinar and we'll have up on our website. But it's important um, when, we're, when we're looking at the patients to understand not just what we see, but also to look at how they feel. And so these forms are a nice way to get them to be able to fill them out. Mm -hmm. And I do like that we can use them at our post-op when we're treating patients to see how what we're doing with an oral appliance is how it's <coughs> improving their health and how they're sleeping and how they're feeling. Now, in our forms, um, we have to look at a few different things. Like we want to look at what the chief complaint is. We want to look at why they're here. We want to get, you know, we if we're doing the stop bang, we're going to need age. We're going to need BMI. We're going to need, you need to know whether they're clenching, grinding. We're going to want to know from, if we're going to be treating them with an oral appliance, we're going to want to know what the TMJ is like. We want to know what their opening is like. We want to know their classification. Um, you alluded to a great point with the class two. Um, there's going to be patients. Now, I don't want us to, to forget about patients that have no obvious issues mm. that can have sleep apnea because they have a high collapsibility of the airway. But I, I have noticed with my team that they're now using this phrase, that person likely has sleep apnea when they see some of their patients. And what that means is my team is starting to learn of what to look for. So they're seeing a patient with a high BMI, class two, clencher grinder, looks tired, looks like they're bar barely walking down the hall. They, they lean back in the chair and they're asleep. And they're thinking, okay, I got to get this patient to see if this correlates and to get them tested. And so, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to belittle the, the concept of, of the screening and the, and the testing, but it gets to a point where you can just say, you're probably of sleep apnea. Totally. But don't forget, there's a numerous number of patients that are baffling where they, you look at them, low BMI, super ultra athlete, and you run a test and they, they have all these complaints and you run a test and they've got moderate sleep apnea. So again, you have to watch out for those. But the forms for us are really about identifying um, not only the, the malampati classification, the oral structures, we're looking at their, their teeth because if they're gonna have an oral appliance, the teeth have to be, we have to have enough teeth. We like at least eight teeth per arch that are stable. We want no gum disease. Um, we're gonna want um, the, the patient we're going to want to know about their history. We're going to want to know about clench and grinding. We're going to want to know about the arch size um, because we're also going to be looking at adjunctive possibilities. If we start identifying a patient with narrow arches that might benefit from, especially with younger patients that might benefit from an orthognathic yeah. consult, you know, so we need all this information brought together. So we have a really nice form for this. And again, we'll have it up on our website in, in, that will help you to put this all together with all the inf information that you need. Now, um, let's move on. And one thing that is important is let's talk about the roles of our team and, and what the team, because really that's what this is about, is what is the roles of our team? So Vish, what is your thought of what the front end person's role is going to be? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And just to uh, further on what you were discussing, the forums and questionnaires, our front end, of course, Mike is going to be responsible for really uh, obtaining those forms, ensuring that they're filled out appropriately, and then inputting them. So <clears throat> uh, that's kind of the main role for the front end. Obviously, having the capability to answer any patient inquiry questions, uh, you get a lot of referrals regarding sleep, and you have a lot of patients in your practice, Mike, that are coming specifically to you uh, for treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So the person who answers the, answers the phone has to have an understanding of what the appointment layout will be, what that methodology will be, what it entails, costs, what to expect, et cetera. And then they're also the ones gonna be coordinating with other health professionals, whether it's the MD who's interpreting the studies, whether it's referrals from chiropractors or MDs, or whether you see a patient, you go through the diagnosis and you realize that their treatment maybe falls beyond what you're able to do in a dental office, your front end is gonna be uh, communicating to those other health professionals whatever your message might be. So that's the role that we have for our front end. Um, 
I think a more critical or involving role is what the assistants do. So talk about, Mike, what your assistants in your office do. Well, for us, the assistants are sort of our, our coordinators of the clinical procedures. And so we have a layout of our appointments, what happens in those appointments, what we're writing down those, in those appointments, what occurs, it's like a checklist. And again, that's another thing that I think would be great to put up. And that's something we have learned over time where we're missing things or something wasn't done or we are missing, uh, an appointment gets confused or we're missing a note. Um, we've really had to make that into a formal layout to make this an efficient, efficient workflow. Now the assistants, we are, are, are gonna be in charge of also taking records. Mm -hmm. So when we're, if we make the decision, we're gonna go ahead and make an oral appliance. They're the ones gonna be capturing the digital, X, uh, the digital pictures, digital x-rays, um, anything that's needed for that case to be able to send off to the lab. They're gonna coordinate with the lab, making sure that the case is getting done, it's coming back. Um, and then they're doing a lot of the chair side work as well, which is inserting uh, the appliance when it comes back. They're also, we're using um, what's called a theragnostic test. And uh, so they're, they're fabricating the trays for that test. Um, and then I'm having, I find with the milled, um, the custom milled appliances, um, very little adjusting is required. And so, but if there is a little bit, then there, it's more than in their wheelhouse to take care of that. And of course, um, they also are in charge of setting them up on the, the take home uh, equipment for the, whether it's the one night sleep study or the theragnostic test. So that's a pretty apt description as to what your assistants do. Uh, the quarterback really of the whole uh, workflow. Talk about your hygienists. So um, I think Vish, you've really covered the hygiene department already with the questions that we're asking, because mm -hmm. really that's what we're, the hygiene department's about. One, we want them taking blood pressures on all the patients. Um, it's super important. Even if you find 5% of your patients with high undiagnosed high blood pressure, that can be huge for whether it's from sleep apnea or whatever it's from. Um, but you could really be changing somebody's lifespan there. Yeah. You know, high blood pressure is correlated with a lower lifespan. Sleep apnea is cor correlated with a lower lifespan. So those one or two patients that complain about why are you taking my blood pressure, you know, work through it uh, with those patients but really it is you know not to be uh, over dramatic but it is about saving lives is my my feeling i'm very strong feelings about um doing that um hygiene department is obviously going to be taking some of the images on patients so they're going to be seeing in the 3d scans the airways and so often they'll do a, an airway uh, scan when we are due for a 3d um so that they can see what the air airway looks like and they can have that conversation with the patient but a lot of the everything, the real heart of hygiene is like when you go to your hairdresser and you're talking to them about their whole life. Um, patients are doing the same thing with our hygienists and they're finding out about not maybe it's about their patient, maybe it's their spouse that is waking them up uh, for snoring. And so we'll maybe get their spouse coming in for a test. So it's really about talking about that. And then from a clinical perspective, that undiagnosed, why does this person still have periodontal disease, yet mm -hmm. they're here, here constantly. Um, it's, it's clenching, grinding, and talking to them about that. It's noticing a scallop tongue. So it's noticing some of those things. And again, it's them being aware of looking at a patient going, hey, this patient should be tested because they're, audit, they're, they're over 50, they have high blood pressure, um, they're clenching, grinding, and I'm looking at them in my chair, they can hardly stay awake, and they're, um, you can see the weight of their body on their, their airway. Um, so that's really where the, the, I think the critical role that the hygienists play is they spend the most time with our patients. Now, we've talked about this being an underdiagnosed problem, Vish. How do you get the word out to your patients or even out to the world about, uh, about sleep apnea being a, a problem? Well, the first aspect, of course, is increasing awareness to existing patients. And I find the most effective mechanism is just encouraging the hygienist to have the conversations that you and I have already laid out, identifying signs and symptoms and asking appropriate questions. Of course, just sending an informational letter to patients informing them that you are currently offering screening for sleep apnea. Should they have any concerns, please reach out, but they may be hearing about it at their upcoming appointments. Uh, front-end media displays, uh, you know, you and I both have modern downtown offices with, 
LCD screens, et cetera. That is captive marketing that is very inexpensive and very, very informative for, as you laid out, a really, really important topic of conversation. Just having those discussions with uh, your team and your patients on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then one thing that we won't get into in too much detail, but something that you and I both provide, which is CBCT. And with the Densply Serona CBCTs that we have, there's the capability of mapping out the airway when you take that CBCT at the new patient intake exam. And of course, then you can show where there's constrictors, et cetera. Uh, then there's the external advertising or opportunity to market, uh, Mike. There's you know educational ads. Of course, uh, you've been on interviews and you're published in this aspect. Uh, you know whether it's just being on news programs or uh, sending out information like that CBC uh, informational uh, publication that we talked about. You can just forward that on to patients who you suspect, uh, suspect of having issues. And then you know all the rage in in today's uh, marketing, of course, is social media, uh, et cetera. A another important component, of course, uh, probably in my opinion, more so than external marketing with ads and, and paid advertisements is marketing to other doctors. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you do for that, Mike? Sure. So the key there is you'll find that it's extremely difficult to just send out referral pads to medical clinics and expect that them actually say that they're going to send anything. Those pads will be on a shelf somewhere uh, or in the garbage pretty fast. But those patients that you see have a medical doctor, they have a chiropractor, they have a physiotherapist. So when you're treating a patient or doing a one night sleep test um, or in any stage of your treatment, what you wanna do, and I find what we do is we do it after the initial testing. We will send a letter out to their medical doctor and other any other primary care uh, physicians involved, whether it's chiropractors mm -hmm. or physiotherapists and say, look, this person has been diagnosed with sleep apnea. This is what our plan of attack is going to be. We're going to do some more testing. We're going to do some more follow-up. And our plan is to get into some sort of therapy, whether it's CPAP or oral appliance. That letter goes out. When those people see that letter, they're like, wow, these guys are thorough. They've given us a good overview of the patient's health history and that they've, they're have they taking care of our patient. So, hey, if I have other patients that are similar, it sounds like these guys mm -hmm. know what they're doing. That is far better than sending out a referral pad that will never see the light of day. Now, we also, once we have treated them, and so we've done that you know, post-ops on them, we've, we've done a post-op test on them, which we'll talk about, we now have the patient treated and they're in the oral appliance and, and we found that they're, they're been effectively treated with the oral appliance. We will then send another letter out to say, this is where this patient at keep an eye on them if anything changes in their health history to let us know now we're we're just double um doubling up on our being thorough mm -hmm. and and doubling up on our communication so i think that's the critical thing so anyways that's that's how we take care of um communication with the other doctors now how about uh the whole workflow um what's the most what do you feel those is the starting point for, for getting going with, with sleep after we've screened them. So obviously the next step is going to be sending them home with a take-home polysomnogram. Um, and you'll talk about the workflow after we get this initial diagnosis, Mike. But essentially the sleep physician is going to be in charge of that diagnosis. It's currently beyond the scope of dentists to diagnose sleep apnea. So with both of the uh, mechanisms that we're using in our office, uh, whether it's the MediBite or the WatchPad and, and the devices that you've used in your office, they can all be read remotely via a portal uh, using Dropbox for uh, a medical doctor to interpret. So they will then interpret the numbers. Uh, they'll give us a diagnosis and then we can proceed forward, whether that suggestion is that the patient requires CPAP, uh, whether their sleep situation was perfectly fine and they would not benefit from any type of oxygen improving devices, or whether they're a candidate for oral appliance therapy. So we'll just get into that test in a little bit more detail, but while we, uh, when we do that, we're gonna need to discuss some definitions, Mike. So one of the, uh, the readings that's gonna come up is the AHI or the uh, apnea hypopnea, hypopnea index. There's also the RDI or the respiratory disturbance index, which is important. Uh, then the ODI, the oxygen desaturation index. And so, you know, essentially apnea is when we stop breathing uh, uh, involuntarily for a period of time. Hypopnea is a partial block involuntarily and, and a uh, interference with regular breathing patterns. 
And then, of course, we're all familiar with what uh, what snoring is. So when we're looking at the numbers, essentially what that medical doctor is going to be looking for is uh, desaturation uh, points where we're losing 4% oxygen or more. Uh, really, the litmus is going to be oxygen at 90% or below. We understand well that physiologically, once our oxygen saturation drops below 90, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, all sorts of undesirable physiologic consequences. So what that medical doctor is going to be looking for is the ODI, the AHI, the RDI, and how high those numbers are and correspondingly how much of a significant oxygen drop there is. Uh, so, of course, on our website and in some of our uh, future periodicals or, or, pardon me, presentations that we give, there'll be those definitions available. Uh, but that's essentially what we're looking for. The, the sleep physician gives us that information, and then we will then follow through with the uh, recommended treatment. So once we have that diagnosis, and let's say for the sake of discussion that uh, oral appliance therapy is recommended, What's the next step then, Mike? So we have the diagnosis. What do we do after that? Yeah, so again, the diagnosis is read by the sleep physician. So we're going to get that letter back. We have that conversation with the patient. Um, the patient is you know, is now aware of, of what level of sleep mm-hmm. apnea they're in. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll add on that it's nice um, with all these definitions. It is a bit complicated. And understanding to read a sleep study and to look at the sleep study does take a bit of work. Uh, we do train uh, on that, and mm-hmm. we do work again with uh, with Shuresh at Shark Education, and, and um, he does have, have some online um, courses, um, Smart Care System that does go into more detail about for you to be able to read those studies as well. But I think there's an importance to understand those definitions, and there's an importance for your team to have a base, a basic understanding of those definitions as well. And we focus that on that when we do our team training course. Because it really is important for everybody to kind of know the lingo because patients are going to ask it. Uh, they're going to be more aware of it, especially as time in, in goes on here. And we have to be able to relate that and correlate that to disease. And it's important to be able to, for not just us, but for our team to have that conversation, to be able to see that, wow, like this patient's oxygen's desatting. It is really important that you mm-hmm. get something going, not just coming from, from us. Now... Um, we run what's called a sleep diagnostic test. And so when we have a patient that's diagnostic, diagnosed with sleep apnea, we want to make sure that they're not in that 30% that will not be a responder. So the matrix uh, system uh, will do a sleep test. So that's for a Zephyr um, Technologies uh, uh, product. And so what it will do is um, we hook them up and the assistants fit them with a titration trays. Mm-hmm. One goes on the top, one goes on the bottom. They're linked together on a basic George gauge and they're attached to a motor to the machine. The machine then runs a two night test. One night where it's moving it in about 300 different positions, testing the position of the lower jaw to see if sleep apnea can be treated. And on night two, it's finding that best position and then locking them in and running a sleep test on them in that new position. If they're a responder, uh, it'll tell us then after that second night that yes, this person's a responder, so they're in the 70%, and it'll give us the place that we're going. So now that gives us basically our treatment plan. And so, Vish, what then would you have your team do uh, moving forward now that we have the results of that? So uh, as you've just mentioned, we now have a therapeutic position uh, that would be the ideal starting point to treat that patient. So the next step is, we're going to have that patient back and we're going to do digital impressions or an intraoral scan. You and I both incorporate 3D or CBCT imaging into our office as well. Uh, it's not a necessary part of the workflow, but it can be helpful and advantageous. Uh, but that's the next step is we're going to have the man where the assistants are essentially going to be taking an intraoral scan. Uh, we, of course, are using the Prime Scan, uh, which is a very effective and fast intraoral scanner. And then you can either use that therapeutic bite to also do a buckle scan to send to the laboratory digitally, or if your lab- laboratory is close by as, as ours is, you can just send in that go- George gauge with the appropriate uh, protrusive therapeutic position that the matrix diagnostic test has determined. Um, so that's the plan. And then of course, uh, the next step is that device is gonna be coming back, the oral appliance therapy or the mandibular advancing device from the lab. Why don't you walk through the fitting process for us, Mike? So 
from that Theragnostic test, we also do have our position set up. So we will request the, request the device to come back fitted to that position. So then when we seat the device, it's already at their therapeutic position, so there is no titration. Now, the devices that we're using, they all have titration ability, Prosomnus, Optisleep, uh, the Somnomeds. They all have the ability for us to shift their position, whether it's uh, different band sizes, screws, um, or different trays. Um, we can change their position forward or back slightly. Now, um, but the benefit is, is that because we've had that theragnostic test and we have a predictive place for that patient to go, the amount of titration required is very minimal. And so this makes our whole insert protocol much more efficient. None of these constant every week they're coming back to turn a screw, none of that is, is occurring. So basically we set them up, put the appliance in, the assistant tries up the top, tries on the bottom, um, then links them together. In this case, let's say it's an OptiSleep, links them together with the, the band that corresponds to the therapeutic position. And we run and we ask them how they're feeling. They, yeah, how's the jaw? Um, and then we're basically sending them home. And nine times out of 10, um, I say hi to that patient, uh, but I am not doing anything at the insert. At the, and then that's really, um, you know, makes the art. And I think that's part of it is from the digital workflow. I think it's part of it by not having PVS impressions. Everything just fits um, with the milled products so much better. I don't know mm -hmm. if you find the same thing. Yeah, totally. So when you're saying nine out of 10 patients don't require anything, when we used to take PVS impressions. The device had to be adjusted. There was tight spots in the anterior region where you'd need a straight handpiece for. And then prior to having the theragnostic testing where we had a definitive starting point, you would need to manually titrate that device to, to determine what would be comfortable. So yeah, we, we found the same thing. The digital workflow has improved accuracy and predictability significantly. Um, so Mike, you basically walked through uh, what the insertion appointment entails. You're not really spending much time. Uh, you send the device home with the patient for the first month. If they're having any issues before then, they're going to obviously contact the office. But with that predictability, uh, at the one month follow up, which we're pre booking, we're going to be checking on the fit and the comfort. At that point, we're also having the patient fill out a sleep quality questionnaire. And if needed, we may be titrating the device forward. Obviously, we're asking them how they're doing, what their quality of sleep is, whether their bed partner is telling them that they're snoring, et cetera. Now, with the theragnostic testing with the matrix, because we have a predictable position to start with that's objective. Obviously, we're not needing nearly as many modifications as one, at the one month follow up as we used to when we would arbitrarily uh, determine a protrusive position. So at the two month follow up, we're basically doing the same thing. And one thing I'll mention is that as the person is in the device for a longer period of time, as their airway is open, a lot of that pharyngeal inflammation or redness starts to go down. So they'll actually have an an airway that opens up even just with that lack of irritation or inflammation. So uh, the results can sometimes improve even just staying in the exact same position over an elongated period of time. And then the three month insertion of course is probably the most important position because if everything is going favorably, we're actually gonna be sending the patient home with a therapeutic follow-up test to make sure that their AHI, their apnea hypopnea index is below 10 and less than half of the original AHI value at their pre-treatment test. You know, one other point that I mentioned was the oxygen saturation. Ideally, we'd like to see that above 90%, uh, hopefully for the entire night, but we'll go over uh, at one of our future courses in much more detail what the criteria for successful follow-up is, but I think that's a pretty good summary. Um, and, you know, if you're looking for more information on this, Mike, you and I have both in years past had consultants come into the office to help train our team on some older technology. It's something that we're currently offering with Digital Workflow Dentistry, doing a full sleep integration course. Uh, and that can be really, really effective. You know, Shark Education and, and Dr. Shuresh is offering some fantastic courses for more experienced users. Uh, but it really depends on where you are in your sleep journey. The important thing is I think all of us should be somewhere on that journey. And if we're not, at least taking the steps to get started on it. 
Uh, and then, of course, ZephyrSleep.com is a great resource for further information, articles, etc. And then, of course, our website uh, has some really useful information as well. So I don't know about you. I'm getting a little bit tired. I'm not sure if this caffeine is going to continue on. It might be time to fill out one of those uh, Epworth sleepiness scale. Yeah, I think we should both, both fill that out. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks, Vishal. Uh, that was great. I think that's a lot of information for the teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think my biggest thing that we've recognized on a day-to-day -day basis is the the key is for the team is to have structured appointments, to know what occurs at each one of those appointments, what the doctor's role in those appointments is so that the front end knows how to book that, and really coordinating that well with the team members checklists are essential and again we're going to post what we're using and we've been updating it constantly over mm -hmm. time um, so there's no sense uh, for people to get started in this and have to struggle through it we've done the struggle and so that's why we want to share this information now if you would like more information and again the things we're posting is our website is uh, digitalworkflowdentist.com uh, on YouTube uh, we're digital dentist Instagram is at Digital Workflow Dentistry and uh, email is Digital Workflow Dentistry at gmail.com. On our Instagram, we do have all the links um, to the podcast, links to our YouTube. Uh, so feel free to sign up. Um, also be aware that we do have a lot of question answers uh, podcasts. So if you have any questions or things that we've touched on and you're not sure about, feel free to contact us. Or feel free to post our Instagram and then we can bring that question up in one of our future podcasts for other listeners. Again, thank you so much, Vishal, for being here. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and have a great day and sleep well tonight. Thanks, everyone. Sleep tight.